He grew up in the small Delta towns of Shelby and Cleveland, and in 1984, he graduated from Ole Miss with a BA in English. After college, Cupwood moved to Jackson and started a record company. From 1984 until 1990, Cupwood's record company released albums by a variety of artists based in the South. In 1989, he entered the magazine business. In the mid-90s, Cupwood sold his Jackson publishing business and moved back to his hometown of Cleveland, where he began the second phase of his company with the Delta Blues Business Journal in 1998, the first and only business journal in the history of the Mississippi Delta. In July of 2003, Cupwood started Delta Magazine, one of the South's premier lifestyle magazines, and in March of 2009, he started the Cleveland Current, Cleveland's Sunday morning newspaper. Cupwood's publishing and e-newsletter ventures now reach more than 200,000 Mississippians. During the past 20 years, Cupwood has served on many boards. In July of 2001, he was supported, appointed by Governor Ronnie Musgrove to serve on the Delta Summit Steering Committee. In 2003, he was elected Vice President of the Delta Council, the Mississippi Delta's premier economic development organization. In 2004, Cupwood was appointed by Governor Haley Barber as the Regional Chairman of Momentum Mississippi, Barber's statewide economic development program. Cupwood also served on Barber's gubernatorial reelection committee in 2007. Cupwood serves on the Board of Energy Corporation, one of the South's largest in utility companies, and on the University of Mississippi Alumni Board. Recently, Cupwood became a board member of the Community Foundation of Northwest Mississippi and serves as that board's secretary. Last month, he joined the board of the Cleveland Music Foundation, the entity building the Grammy Museum that will open there this September. And last week, Governor Phil Bryant appointed Cupwood to be a commissioner for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Upon his confirmation by the Mississippi Senate, Cupwood will be one of the five commissioners helping to oversee Mississippi's wildlife, fisheries, and parks. Cupwood has been married to the former Cindy Callahan of Jackson for 25 years, and they have three children. Thomas, who is 20, who is the KA fraternity president at Mississippi State. Jordan, who is 18, who is a freshman here at Ole Miss, and daughter Travis, who is 13. Mr. Cupwood will now introduce our guest author and defense expert, Van Hip. Thank you. Well, uh, we're, we're delighted to be here at the Overby Center. Uh, we're filming this. It'll be on the, the website. Uh, so y'all can take a look at this later on if you'd like. Uh, and then after Vance talk, we have 50 books that we'd like to give away and it, he'll sign to everyone. So we'll try to shut this down a little bit early so y'all can make your 11 o'clock classes and also we'll have some key, uh, some Q and A's. Uh, but Van Hip is our, our guest today. Uh, Van is from South Carolina. Uh, Van is also a graduate of the University of South Carolina Law School. Is that right, Van? And uh, Van uh, moved to Washington. Uh, he is the chairman of American Defense International. Uh, Van has a large uh, Army background and uh, is one of the Washington insiders uh, like you wouldn't believe. And if you watch Fox News or any of the news channels, you often see Van on here as a commentator. Uh, so that's Van's background. His information, all, all of his information will also be on the website uh, as well. So uh, Van has written a new book and uh, we're here to talk about not only that, uh, but the current state of terrorism uh, in the world that uh, is growing by each day. Uh, so with that, uh, Van, welcome to Ole Miss. Uh, and uh, if you would, I'd like to ask you one quick question. And why did you write this book? First of all, it's great to be here at Ole Miss. And when I, Scott, I got to tell you, when I started putting on my Facebook and Twitter that I was coming to Ole Miss, I got all these tweets and messages back on Facebook that said hotty toddy. So it's good to be here at... Uh, Van didn't know what that means, by the <laughs> yeah. way. But my wife knows what it means. It's a pretty good drink. But anyhow, but, uh, she <laughs> said, but, but it is good to be here. And uh, yeah, you know, as you pointed out, years ago, I used to run the mobilization office uh, for the Army when I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army. So I had to learn a little bit about a lot of things that you need to go to war. And I would say um, uh, over the years, I had, I had written a fair amount about the link between Iran and North Korea and the missile technology, the nuclear technology. And an old friend of mine who actually had worked for President Reagan said, Van, a lot of people have written books on, on Iran and North Korea. There needs to be a real book looking at the totality of the threats to America and what it's gonna take to make this country safe. It was tough to do. 
It's a, it's a tough subject, uh, this, the yes. new terrorism, and the threats are so constantly changing. So uh, it was tough to do, but uh, I, I uh, had a lot of great help. And, uh, but there needed to be a book about the totality of the threats to, to America and what we've got to do to make the country, keep the country safe without going broke. Well, Ben, we all talk about the cyber, cyber war that now we're <clears> seeing as a new war. Uh, can you, or is the U.S. adequately equipped to handle a cyber war right now? I mean, we're just starting to see it, but can we handle it or where are we? I would say that uh, I call cyber the fifth dimension of warfare. You got land, air, sea, space, and now cyber. And unlike the others, it's artificial. It's tough to defend against. I would say, and I say this in the book, the United States is the most unprepared for cyber war of any threat. You mean individuals or the government? Every, I mean, the government, the government and businesses. And so I distinguish between different types of hacks and what we can do to keep this country safe. Uh, the, top, um, the top cyber experts at both the National Security Agency and the CIA will tell you, and I think this is important for, particularly for students here at, at Ole Miss to, un, to understand, we need between 20 and 30,000 true cyber experts in this country to defend against the most dangerous attacks and, and, and be able to thwart them. Guess how many we have? Only 1,000 in America. One of the recommendations and things that I call for in the book is to have national security scholarships to go to our very best computer science majors on college campuses so that we can get up to that 20 or 30,000 that we need. I also call for uh, not a preemptive war, uh, but a preventive war and to get aggressive on it. Uh, there are two major uh, attacks that I talk about. The Chinese are trying to get our IP. Uh, and, that's, and, and they're going after a lot of our businesses in America who are losing hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in intellectual property every year. It's almost like death by a thousand hacks. Uh, and, with the, and with the Chinese, we can trace them back to two different groups that have ties to the military. The Chinese government says well, they have nothing to do with them. Fine, if you've got nothing to do with them, then join with us and let's, well, let's declare these organizations cyber terrorist groups and go after them. The Iranians, we talk about the radical Islamists. They're not interested in espionage. They're interested in sabotage. And so a lot of Iranian attacks and radical Islamist attacks on our cyber networks of financial institutions. And Scott, this is important. If we think 2000, the, the 2008 financial crisis was bad, we've seen nothing. If you have a major financial cyber attack on a financial institution, these two big to, uh, to fail banks have only gotten bigger. And, 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 and they could take down a bank before the government even could even respond. So I say as far as Iran is concerned, you do that one more time, we're going to cut your optical cables, we're going to interfere with the transponders on the satellites, and you're not going to have any more internet. Well, you know, talking about Iran, the latest thing is we all know we're talking about <coughs> nuclear weapons and are they going to build them and have they already built them and all that. But along those lines, how safe are our ports and our harbors and all that against any attack right now? We know that in your book you mentioned there are two gigantic missile defenses. One is in Alaska, other one's in California somewhere, but the East Coast is very vulnerable, right? Yes, and we, brought, we mentioned in the book that we do not have a land-based missile defense capability on the East Coast. Uh, not at all. Not at all. Uh, and, but we have, well, in the book, we talk about measures that we can take to have uh, as a gap filler uh, with our Aegis uh, ships, with, our, with our, ballistic, our, our Aegis ballistic missile defense capability, things we can do there. My concern is the way it's configured now, it's more for the short range ballistic missiles, it needs to be configured, uh, configured for intercontinental ballistic missiles, you know, the ICBMs. But for, and this is important here as I'm in Mississippi, our, our, har our, our harbors and our ports. In doing the research for the book, I spoke to a friend of mine who commanded two minesweepers for the United States Navy. I was shocked to learn the lack of mine countermeasure capability that we have on the east coast of the United States and in the Gulf of Mexico. So I call for an enhanced uh, mine countermeasure capability uh, for both the Gulf of Mexico and on the east coast. There are 250,000 mines out there right now. And in addition, let me say this, and this is important. I remember a few years ago, there was a report where British intelligence had found out that uh, the North Koreans had sold to Al-Qaeda underwater IED devices. Now, what would you be doing with an underwater IED device? Hmm. Remember with these guys, it's about inflicting harm on the American economy. So one of the things that I call for is using autonomous underwater vehicles to do periodic checks of the seabeds 
of our ports and, and harbors periodically to check to make sure that, uh, that, that they're safe. Mm -hmm. Well, along those lines, Van, our ports and harbors, immigration obviously is a big deal. We can talk about that every day as well. How safe would our borders be for immigration, people sneaking through with other with ideas and forming these sales and all that in this country? Where are we in that, do you think, right now? We, we saw what happened recently in France, uh, and all about a cartoon about the Prophet Muhammad and so forth. Do you remember a couple years ago, there was a Danish cartoonist, we talk about this in the book called, uh, named Kurt Westergaard, who, uh, and the, there, there was an imam, Saeed Jaziri in Europe, who had been banned from entry into Canada and into France, he put out a fatwa and called for his execution. We caught that imam. You know, Scott, you know where we caught him? A couple of years ago, in the back of a trunk of a BMW trying to come into America from Mexico. Mm. Our, own, our former FBI director testified to Congress in 2011 that in 2010, the United States captured 59,000 people from countries other than Mexico, including Somalia, Iran, Yemen, Pakistan, Syria, you name it, trying to illegally come into the country. My question is, where are the ones we didn't catch? Where are they today in America, and what are they doing? And then we saw last week the FBI director, after he had been here to Mississippi, he now says he has active investigations, open files, of people with potential links to ISIS in all 50 states of America. And then, you know, they're using our technology somewhat to hurt us from Google to Twitter to Facebook. I mean, that seems to be a, a blazing trail for them. How do, we, how do we combat that? How can we handle that and fight that? You're right. And, and Jihadi John has a degree in computer programming from Westminster University in Great Britain. The um, technology, and this is one of the things we talk about in the book, Technology is good, and I've got one of these iPhones with all kinds of apps, just like you got. Technology is changing so quickly. But the problem is, as technology changes, our government is so stovepiped and lacks the ability to analyze and adapt and respond to the new technology and to incorporate it, that it's almost as if the technology, that the threats as a result of the advanced technology are increasing exponentially because of our ability to adapt the, to the technology and, and incorporate it and respond. It takes months or three It takes years, months. Three, three years, doesn't it? Probably? Yeah. You talk about Google. Google, when you go on Google, Google gives you only the most popular search. There's something called OSINT, Open Source Intelligence. Our former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency said that 90% of the intelligence that we get and we need comes from open sources. But we spend the, probably the least amount of time and effort on that. There was something called the Aspen Brown Commission before 9-11 that said to the intelligence community, you need to do more with open source intelligence. It's something I call for in the book, but I put it into practice. A couple of years ago, I went to a university and asked them to do a search, open source, on one of their search engines in Farsi. Guess what I found out? All public information that the Iranians were on the ground in North Korea helping them with their missile test and nuclear test. Went on Fox News with Bill Hemmer and was the first person in the United States to report that. And I also looked in Japanese, had the search engine look in Japanese, and we found a report from the Japanese Kyoto Agency confirming what, what we had seen in Farsi uh, from Iran. Bottom line is we need to do a better job of stuff that's staring us in the face that's out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that we call for in the book. Well, you know, Van, we talked about ISIS. Maybe most of us, I know me, I hadn't, I hadn't heard the word ISIS for, I guess, a couple of years ago, but obviously they have been organizing and been at it for a long time, right or wrong? Yeah. Well, it, it, it came out of Al-Qaeda, and then they were kicked out of Al-Qaeda. Uh, uh, Why were they kicked out? Uh, well, yeah, because the leader of, of ISIS all of a sudden wanted to uh, take over Al-Qaeda in Syria and wanted that, the guy who heads Al-Qaeda in Syria, to report to him. He complained to Al-Qaeda leadership, and then... Uh, the rest is history, he was kicked out. But they're all, and we talk about this in the book, the new terrorism, they're all ir ir radical Islamists. And it's important to understand what motivates them, what's the history. And we go back to like uh, Islamist scholars in the 15, back to the 1500s. It's all about going back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad and restoring what they call the caliphate and going back to the first four caliphs or caliphs after Muhammad and restoring that. So they call for now, Scott, they call for uh, they, they claim that one-third of Syria and one-third of Iraq is already a caliphate. I have a lot of 
friends around the country, and some of them don't always vote the way I do, and that's fine by me. We have different political philosophies. And those particular people say the problem we're having is that America needs to get out of the Middle East. That, that is, that's the issue why they continue to do things to us is they want us out of their country, out of their lives, and all that. So if we had that approach, if we just left them alone, would things be better? Would it be worse? What, what do you think? No, because they're already here in this country. And uh, when I see someone like King Abdullah there in the Middle East stepping up, and by the way, I first met King Abdullah over 20 years ago mm -hmm. when he commanded the, the Jordanian Special Forces. And I can tell you he's the real deal. To me, this is an opportunity, an opportunity for America to seize the moment. When I see we've got six Arab countries involved to some degree now in the fight against ISIS and the radical Islamists, when I see King Abdullah, who, by the way, is a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, who better than someone like King Abdullah, who understands the West, to take the fight on behalf of moderate and reformed Muslims to radical Islam? This is an opportunity for the United States. We need to stand with King Abdullah and give him everything he needs. So I say be engaged there now so that we don't have to fight it here on our own soil. Well, you know, we talk about the term political correctness. How has that term and those views affected the way we're, we're, we're viewing Islam and the whole Middle East situation? Political correctness is killing us. We need to condemn political correctness. I'll give you an example. Do you remember the imam? Uh, no, yeah. Uh, do you remember the, the mosque in Falls Church, Virginia, where two or three of the 9-11 hijackers went? Yep. The imam was uh, Anwar al-Awlaki. Uh, there, um, I'm trying to think, who else was there too? Oh, Nadal Malik Hassan, the army major terrorist who killed all the people at Fort Hood. Uh, he went there. What if just one person had come forward? We could have been able to, to, to thwart so many terrorist attacks. So a couple of things. I call for a program to reward moderate and reform Muslims who come forward with actionable intelligence uh, so that we can, uh, that we can uh, thwart it. Now, last week, they caught the three guys, the, the three Brooklyn youth who were trying to go and join ISIS. Right. <clears throat> Back in August of last year, one of them had, had written crazy things on the internet, wanted to attack a President Obama, things like that. And that's when they started tracking. That's when they started tracking. But let me go back a, a little bit. <clears throat> Nadal Malik Hassan, the major, had eight, we, the FBI had intercepted, had 18 emails from him to Anwar al Awlaki. Now, is that a red flag or is that a red flag? Definitely. And his coworkers are complaining about the crazy anti-American statements and Islamic statements that he's making. No one did anything because of political correctness. If we had, just think of the lives that could have been saved at Fort Hood had someone had the guts to do the right thing. Political correctness is killing us. Well, you know, in regard to, to strengthening our borders and, and getting our ducks in a row, uh, apparently the bureaucracy and the red tape is enormous and we just can't move fast enough to do it. What are your thoughts or comments on that? Is that right? It is. And we have a whole chapter on that that goes through the growth of, of government regulations uh, and many of them uh, directly impacting national security and so forth. Uh, one of the things I call for, you know, we have a BRAC commission uh, to bec because dealing with um, which military bases we needed was getting too political to try to have an independent BRAC commission look at them and do it in such a way, a procedure, where Congress and the President couldn't go and say, well, I'm gonna remove this one because it's in my hometown or whatever. Right. I call for something similar to that uh, for regulations uh, so that we can get rid of many of the unnecessary regulations uh, out there right now. Well, in your book, you talk about uh, the various overhauls that need to take place and all that in order to get our ducks in a row. Uh, it sounds awfully expensive. Uh, is it a doable thing, and how do you suggest we go about yep. moving through that red tape and yep. bureaucracy? My last chapter, I call it Victory Without Bankruptcy. How do we pay for all the things we need to keep America safe and not go broke? One of the things I talk about is completely changing the way we do contracting at the Pentagon, moving away from a cost plus contracting system. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the government, uh, one of the government watchdog groups revealed that major acquisition period, I mean, uh, systems from like 2001 to 2008 had $300 billion in cost overruns. Mm -hmm. I call for more of a prospective payment system where a contractor is incentivized to get it done, not have the cost overruns, where the government, you know, doesn't see this as a blank check to just keep adding stuff to that tab. Right. We could save a lot of money there. 
Um, I also say that, you know, we've cut the U.S. military 30 percent since uh, the end of the Cold War, but we've increased the number of three and four star generals 19 percent. Now, some of my general admiral buddies probably going to disagree with me, but we need to cut some of that bureaucracy too. But again, though, but but now also let me say we have cut the U.S. military, the Army, for example, to pre-World War II levels. We've cut in the wrong places. I would restore those cuts, but I would I would I would more than make up for for the things I would do with contracting, making better use of the Guard and Reserves. We can train three or four guardsmen for every one active duty soldier. Van, what what are the true goals of ISIS? I mean, what what are they what do they want to accomplish? Do you know? We talk about that in the book. It's what radical Islam wants. So they want a world that is under totally radical dominated. Islam, and and for infidels to to convert and live. Uh, they call it debilitude. We talk about that in the book as second class citizens. And if you don't, they're going to kill you. Mm -hmm. If you were sitting in the White House today, what are the three or four things you would do immediately, having a presidential signature in order to make it happen? I would define the threat for what it is: this global jihadist movement is radical Islam. It is a challenge of our time. It is not a gang. It is not uh, uh, some kind of a criminal ac activity of a, of, a, of a criminal enterprise. It is, it, is, uh, it is radical Islam. I would define the threat. Mm -hmm. I would listen to my ground commanders. General Lloyd Austin, who's the CENTCOM commander, told President Obama back in 2010 when we had 90 percent of ISIS's predecessors organization wiped out to leave a small residual force so it would not reconstitute itself. I believe if President Obama had listened to the ground commanders then, we would not be having this conversation today. I would do that. Uh, but then uh, I would stand with the, those six uh, Arab countries that are trying to take the fight to, uh, to ISIS. I'd give King Abdullah everything he needs. I would do those things. I would improve our cyber. Um, I would strengthen, I would, I, would, I would direct the military to share their latest sensor technology now with Customs and Border Patrol to cut down and, and, and stop uh, the, um, uh, the, the illegals who are coming here, as well as bad things like radioactive substances coming to the United States. Van, what do you think that, um, what, did you happen to see Netanyahu's speech yesterday? Did you follow that or anything like that? It was, it, it, look, I'm, I'm also- Say a few comments about that, yeah. the situation they face and the whole thing. We send all the wrong messages to friends and foe alike. We, we, we throw our friends under the bus and we try to cut nuclear deals with terrorist regimes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it sends the wrong kind of message to friends, but it also sends the wrong kind of message to foes. I talked about open source intelligence and the link between North Korea and Iran. It's not a coincidence that Kim Jong-un, the day before Netanyahu's speech, fired two missiles, two of his missiles, missile technology that he has already shared with the Iranians. Well, you know, the bottom line is on this on this new agreement they want, it's a 10-year deal. I mean, isn't that just horrendous to you? To you? I mean, how do you, yeah. it is to me, yeah. but how do you feel about that? I mean, Well, if anyone wants to give up their nuclear program and, uh, and wants to have verified inspections like that, fine. But this is a regime that's trying to take down our financial institutions uh, and, 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 and is, you know, sharing our nuclear and missile technology back and forth uh, with, the, uh, with, with the North Koreans. Uh, it is a terrorist regime, uh, and, and they're on the terrorist uh, uh, li list at the State Department, but yet we're trying to cut a deal with them. Did we not, in America, did we not, any of our presidents, Republican, Democrat alike, did we not see this developing 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago? Did we not see this coming, this ISIS movement and all these radical uh, people over in the Middle East? One of the reasons you know, we had the kickoff <clears throat> of our book launch last week at the Nixon Library and people ask me, why did you have it at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library? A few years after 9-11, uh, I was laying awake one night and had the TV on, and they were showing one of President Nixon's last interviews before he died in 1994. And they asked him, as we approach the 21st century, mm -hmm. what do we as Americans need to be most concerned with? Mm -hmm. He said, the rise of Islamic fanaticism. I went back and looked at one of his last books, <clears throat> the next to last book called Seize the Moment. Mm -hmm. where he talked about uh, uh, Islamist fundamentalist, the Sharia law and things like that. So um, um, he, he was a visionary. Uh, so, so a few people did see it coming. Right. You know, in the 1990s, uh, uh, bin Laden declared war in the United States twice. Yeah. Uh, and and, and we, 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 we took it for granted. Just overlooked it, didn't really think yeah. it meant anything. Yeah. Just take it seriously. Yeah. So it's important mm -hmm. to see it's a cancer that's growing. And one thing, 
something your wife asked me. I tell you, she asked a great question to me beforehand about Boko Haram and these other groups. I told her to ask you that. Oh, you did? Well, she, well, she did. And so Boko Haram is an indirect affiliate of Al-Qaeda. But if you notice lately, they are trying to mimic the tactics of ISIS. In the, in, in the book, The New Terrorism, I, I talk about the country of Niger. The 9-11 Commission said that 9-11 was a failure of imagination. We keep responding to the last attack, the last threat. We need to think outside the box so that we can prevent the next threat. I talk about Niger, which has one of the world's largest uranium reserves, uranium that can be made for nuclear weapons. It's a very, uh, in terms of stability, it's an unstable area there. <clears throat> Guess, and I talk about working with the French because Niger got their independence from France in 1960. Working with them to get those uranium reserves out of there. Well, guess what's happened the last two or three weeks? Boko Haram has begun border attacks on the country of Niger. So again, we've got to get ahead of this thing, nip it in the bud, and do things like that. Well, Van, you, so I know you know the ins and outs of Washington. You're an insider in a big way. <clears throat> Sometimes we, just in, in rural middle America, we're presented one thing uh, over C-SPAN or Fox or CNN, anything like that, and then the insiders in Washington, those congressmen and senators and all that, are really th talking about something else. So do you think, it, from your insider's view in Washington, that does Congress and all the leaders, they feel like we can really wipe out ISIS and be through with them one day? I mean, they think it's a doable deal to, for that to happen? Now, I live half my time in South Carolina, so I'm a, in, in, in Georgetown County, so I'm still a... Uh, I'm, a, one of I'm an outsider uh, who's looking in, though. Yeah. But I would say this. Um, we can, yes, uh, and, and you're seeing more. Uh, fortunately, I, and I call for more bipartisanship. I'd say that it's time for conservatives to work with what I call the old uh, Scoop Jackson Democrats. I'm dating myself a little bit, but uh, I call them now. Actually, Bill Maher coined the phrase the 9-11 liberals. Someone as a conservative Republican I may not agree with on, um, on economic policy or social policy and so forth, but they still love their country and they understand that it's about keeping America safe. So I, we need to work with what I call the 9-11, the conservatives need to work with the 9-11 liberals on the national security issues to do whatever it takes mm -hmm. to keep America safe. We can beat ISIS. We can beat radical, uh, defeat radical Islam, but we've got to have the right systems in place so that it does not reconstitute itself mm -hmm. so we don't have to continually do this. I'm a big fan of something called the Al Hura Network. Uh, the Al Hura Network, our State Department started it. It's not propaganda, but it exposes young people to Western thought and Western values in that part of the world when so much of their programming is just anti-Western values, anti just venom 24-7. Yeah. Expose, them, expose them to Western thought and Western values. So that's one of the things I mentioned in the book. Ben, now in your book, you, know, you list that you're giving uh, all the proceeds uh, to the National Guard, families that are looking for scholarships, yeah. who wounded warriors type thing. Yeah. Say a few words. One hundred percent of my proceeds will go to the National Guard uh, Educational Foundation uh, uh, for a scholarship that they have established uh, that will go for the children of fallen guardsmen. Uh, unfortunately, so many of these kids are beginning to come of college age, uh, there's, and and so uh, they're looking. Uh, for ways to raise money to help provide scholarships for these kids. So 100% will go in the National Guard Association and the National Guard Education Foundation has this on the website and they will begin taking uh, scholarship applications in January of 2016. And I would also say that the National Guard Education Foundation is taking zero in terms of administrative cost or expenses. That's good. Why don't we, it's 1030, why don't we open now uh, for some Q&As from the audience uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, after we're through with that, Van can say a few words, and then we have 50 bucks. The first 50 will come up here. He'll sign them and hand it to you free of charge. Uh, so why don't we have a question or two from the audience now? Back in the back.
You are so right. And I tell people, you know, the reason we have a federal government, the reason the states came together in the first place was to provide for the common defense of the people. That's why we have a federal government. You're exactly right. And the problem I see with both Republicans and Democrats, so many of them have to check in with their respective congressional committee to get their talking points to find out what they believe in that day. The founding fathers of America didn't have the talking points. They had it in here. They knew what they believed. They had core values and they had an inner core. They knew what, what, it, what it meant to, to be an American. One of the things I talk about in the book as an example of, 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 of working together and, and accomplishing something, I think what you're getting at, I talk about, remember, I talk about Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia and Duke Luger of Indiana and what they did with Nunn Luger back in the early 1990s when the Soviet Union dis disintegrated. We had a problem on our hands with all these nuclear weapons out there in so many of these unstable new countries. Nunn Luger, the way those guys worked together to dismantle that stuff, to get it out of most of those countries and convert a lot of it to energy here in this country, that to me is the model. Uh, and, and I talk about that. We need to go back and study and try to replicate that model because they did a lot of good things on nuclear weapons and we need that same kind of, uh, of uh, effort today in dealing with this. Ed, you had a question. Sam, what about a small town America? If, if this thing continues to be a threat, sooner or later the soft target is going to be easy. Yes. We, we recognize it clearly there that there people come across the borders of the South and you can do some real damage with a good football weekend. Yes, sir. One of the things I talk about, you're right, the soft target scenario is the, is the toughest scenario, particularly when we've already led all these people in this country uh, who, 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 by the way, are not coming here as part of some church outreach mission program to America. They're coming to do us harm. One of the things I call for in the book, which I think helps address the soft target scenario, is a true situational awareness hotline in real time, completely separate than the 911 calls. We don't want to jam that. And, that, and the situational awareness hotline would be this. In this day of iPhones and so forth, people when they see something that doesn't look right, they could instantaneously text a photo back to a central database that has all the analytical tools to immediately connect the dots, put it together, and, and then rapidly respond. Uh, and we've got the technology to do that, to do that. And I will tell you, if you ask the emergency management directors at the state level, do they want something like this, and can we do it? They would say, absolutely. We need that kind of capability. So that's one of the specific things I call for is a true situational awareness hotline for America where the average citizen can be involved when they see something suspicious. Cindy? First question, I'm getting that question everywhere I go. Because people are frustrated. The American people get it. They see, they agree with King Abdullah who this weekend said it's World War III. And he said that Muslims and Christians need to work together to go after the radical Islamists. Uh, so the American people get it and they're frustrated. And you know, I wish and pray that Obama, President Obama would get out of campaign mode and get in commander in chief mode. And, and so this to me is an opportunity for the Congress to lead. The Congress has got to lead on both sides. But the American people get it. Our military gets it. If you talk to our, uh, to our military men and women, they're frustrated. And so, um, um, and that's, you know, again, one of the reasons why I, I wrote this book. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And the second question was, yeah, yeah. And that's why I said we've got to work with the moderate and reform Muslims. The reform Muslims in particular, uh, uh, the, the moderate Muslims will come when they see the reform Muslims stepping out. And, uh, uh, and that's why, 
like that program I mentioned, to, to reward the moderate reform Muslims so that they're not ostracized in their own community when they come forward. Up here at the top. I would say start with your National Guard, because the National Guard uh, is dual-hatted in so many of the states. The Adjutant General is both the, the head of the National Guard, but also the Homeland Security Director, heavily involved in, in, in Homeland Security. And our Guard is playing such a vital role, uh, and, and they're at the local level. Everyone knows someone in their neighborhood or down the street or in their family who's in the National Guard. I would also say uh, get to know and talk to the State Emergency Management Director. I went to a... Um, to a hearing, for example, a field hearing at, in a state where the local state emergency management director got up and spoke. And, uh, uh, and, he, and, and he said things that reminded me of the situational <clears throat> awareness hotline that I wrote about in the book. Those are the things we need. And that's the kind of person, if something bad happens, <clears throat> is going to be on the front line coordinating the response. They know what they're going to need. I would. Uh, uh, and, 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 and what's going to work at, at the local level. So those are the kind of, I think those are good stories and at the local level uh, that are going to be so important to you. Somebody had a hand up. There you go, Jim. The, the visual image of um, ISIS that you see on television every night, there's a bunch of guys, machine guns, nobody's in uniform, there's a, bunch, there's a couple guys in the back of a truck holding a you know, rocket launcher. What, what's bigger and darker behind? It's a cancer that is growing. They're more sophisticated now with the technology. We're seeing that. Um, the CIA estimates that probably ISIS has 32,000 soldiers was one of the estimates that I have seen. But when you talk to the Kurdish uh, Peshmerga and others who are involved in the fight, they say it's much greater, upwards closer to 200,000. So it's, uh, this is, this, they're, they're very sophisticated. And, and very, um, and, and it's, a, it's a growing cancer. And when I see what's, you know, when I see that, you know, these, these three Brooklyn youths, I mean, this, 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 is, this is crazy. I mean, it is, I, I, about, uh, I think a year or two after 9-11, I was on Fox and I started, I, I used the phrase, it's a world on fire. And a few weeks later, people started using that. And I mentioned that, I think, in the first chapter of, of the introduction, how and when the world caught on fire. So, uh, um, this is, um, and back to like to President Obama, to not call this threat radical Islam it would be akin to Franklin Roosevelt in World War II, not calling Nazi fascism Nazi fascism, but calling it German aggression. So we need to understand the threat. And um, this really is the challenge of our time. This is the challenge of our time, and this country needs to wake up. Then, you know, we talk about one way to control situations, economic sanctions. Would that really work or not? I mean, do those guys really care about money over there or not? <laughs> well, uh, the guy who beheaded, and I mentioned this in the book, who beheaded Daniel Pearl wasn't looking for a job. He was, the, he was a graduate of the London School of Economics. So these people are not looking for a job. Yes, sir. There is with this president, Al Sisi. President Al Sisi uh, conducted airstrikes in Libya. He's another one out of the, uh, you know, that's that stepped up now to the plate like King Abdullah. So it's an opportunity uh, uh, for the United States to work. I mean, that's one of the six countries uh, that uh, where at least their leadership gets it. We've got a question up here, Van. Yeah, we've, we have cut in the wrong places. One of the things I talk about, too, if you look at defense spending today as a percentage of the budget, uh, go back to 1960, you'll be shocked. It's a lot less today. What we spent on defense is so much less than what we spent in 1960. I mean, it's dramatically 
uh, uh, less. Uh, one of the things I talk about, we have a $589 billion defense budget, but I think it kind of uh, gives people the wrong impression. It's not all for defense. Uh, the, uh, the cost of the health care cost and TRICARE and things like that are just skyrocketing while we're actually cutting soldiers. So what I say for is get that out of the defense budget, make it an independent agency where it's under a big spotlight and we can perhaps have more really meaningful reform and, and, and do the right things to get ahead of those increasing costs. And then people will see what we really are paying on just pure defense. How about back in the back up there? What kind of direct action do you think needs to be taken to, in order to be, uh, what kind of direct action do you think the United States needs to be I think right now with what's going on in Tikrit is a, um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a test run, if you will, uh, for Mosul. Uh, uh, to, they got about 27,000 troops, I believe, engaged in that. I think they're trying to see what works. Uh, to glean intelligence in terms of how big the ISIS force is. Um, I think what is needed right now is to do whatever it takes to work with King Abdullah and those six countries. And yes, for people to say that we can, I mean, do we need uh, uh, ground troops? We, at the end of the day, history teaches us you have to have the grunt on the ground to finish the job. That's just the way it is. And, and I don't care what some a uh, 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 study written by someone who's never been in the military says that we can do everything with just air power and a few special forces. You're going to have to have uh, some ground force. I believe it can be limited, and had we listened to General Austin in the first place, it, it, it would have been limited. Uh, but the longer this goes and that we do not respond, it's going to take more. Uh, but right now it's an opportunity. This is an opportunity for us to have some kind of limited ground presence working with people like King Abdullah to defeat this thing, but then, like I said, have the systems in place so it doesn't reconstitute itself. Dan, uh, let me ask you a question. Let's take one more, then we'll sign some books. Where is Russia in all this? What is their position? And, and tell me, comment on that a minute. Make no mistake, Vladimir, Vladimir Putin is just an old KGB agent who is uh, just posing as president of Russia. He. Uh, 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 and again, he's another one we've sent all the wrong signals to. When you cut the United States Army down, like I said, to pre-World War II levels, when you tell Georgia, Georgia, a country that has, since 2005, wanted to come into NATO, and the United States has said, we will support your NATO membership application, and then last March, the president goes to Brussels and, tell, and says publicly, that Georgia is not currently on a pathway to NATO membership? What kind of message does that send to a KGB thug like Putin? And now we're surprised that he's doing what he's doing? A guy like that only understands one thing, and that's strength. Well, back in top, right there, last question. A couple quick things, uh, they found in some of those caves in Afghanistan that Al Qaeda was in, uh, USDA uh, food training, uh, food manuals years ago back there. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. Uh, the electromagnetic pulse threat is a very real threat. Uh, there's concern that uh, the North Koreans may already have an electromagnetic pulse warhead. How that happens real quick. Yeah, which is a nuclear burst at a high altitude that takes out your power grid. No one gets killed or anything like that, right? Just Nobody gets killed in nuclear fallout, but you have no power. You can't go to the bank, you can't go to the ATM machine, you can't refrigerate food. And today, the American farmer cannot grow enough food for the American people without electricity. So what's going to happen over, over the next several months? And if you don't believe what I say about the EMP threat from a North Korea or someplace, look what NASA says. NASA says that in the next 10 to 100 years, it is inevitable that we will have a geomagnetic storm, uh, storm on the sun what they call a Carrington event. We had one of those which does the same thing, it wipes out your power grid. We had one of those in 1859. But in 1859, we weren't so dependent on electricity. And the, and the American farmer could grow enough for the American people to eat. So that's a very real threat. Okay, with that, why don't we uh, thank you, Van, for being here. Thank you. And uh, again, if you'll check the website out, you'll be able to see all this, plus some additional information coming up. Uh, Charlie, Blueterrorism.com. 
newterrorism.com. Uh, this Van site. Why don't we, let's, anybody would like a book, come on and get one, uh, no charge, and Van will sign it. So thank you all for being here. Thank you.